Let's briefly um, just recap that quickly. We saw the optimal altitude for these adaptations was between 2,000 or 2,500 meters. Pushing 2,500 seems to be most desirable. Even though all of them demonstrated a change in red cell mass, the 2,500 meter group was the one that saw an improvement in VO2 max and performance. And then at 2,500 meters for at least three, but probably four weeks where we see that nice last jump will, um, uh, will be the, the time that is sufficient to cause an increase in, uh, in red cell content. So these are percent changes in, in uh, red cell volume. So four weeks shows near maximal adaptation. But how long does it take before we see an effect? How long do we need to transition at altitude before being able to compete? What's the minimum amount of time required? Not as well studied, and it seems that the variability comes into play here again. But we know immediate arrival is not advised. And one of the only studies that has really looked at the transition to altitude wasn't 2,500 meters. It's a a modest decrease from 2,500 meters. But over two days, moving to that altitude, 6, 18, and 47 hours later, evaluating uh, time completed in a time trial, we see this initial large drop in performance that gradually recovers. And note it's not even fully recovered at two days. It's not fully recovered at 47 hours. So the recovery has slowed. We're not sure exactly how long it will take to completely normalize or if it does normalize. Maybe it doesn't normalize on acute time frames like this. Time completed in a time trial. Um, the type of time trial was a, a shuttle run test. You ever done those, like a beep test? You run from one end of the gym to the other. Uh, on each beep and the beeps get closer and closer together and the total time or the number of stages you can do indicates your, your performance. This is the kind of test that we're looking at here. Larger the performance, larger the time, greater the performance. So at least 48 hours, if not somewhat more, and not complete recovery, still a minute difference in performance of that beep test, which is pretty large when you think about it. It's 10% just under 10%. If you do adapt, how long can you expect those benefits to hang around? Is there any residual benefit? And maybe persistence isn't the right word. Um, longevity is not really the right word either, but how long would you expect these benefits to, to reside or to, um, to hold on after exposure and return to sea level? And for this information, we can return to the uh, Levine and Stray Gunderson study that we looked at, and then Chapman that was at the start of this section, looking at the different altitudes, also out of the same lab, gives us a sense of uh, at least the two-week mark. So we have two weeks on the right. We have a total of three weeks post-exercise on the left, even though this goes to 14 weeks on the x-axis, these numbers fall at the 13-week mark. And we're looking at a comparison of performance times. Now we know the data on the left, I didn't have the, uh, the legend back up, the, the gray circles were the live high, train low, that seemed to uh, provide the most robust improvements in performance. Again, everyone seemed to improve during the lead-in phase. Only the live high train low group saw an improvement during the experimental phase. The live high train high didn't improve. They stayed pretty uh, consistently fast, whereas the live low train low group even regressed somewhat. So lower numbers here, 5,000 meter completion time. The lower the, the dot is on the scale, the faster the completion time and the better the performance. We see that at least three weeks out, even an arguably continued improvement 
in the uh, live high train low group. The variability means it's not significant. There's still um, uh, there's a preservation of the performance that was earned during the altitude exposure. So at least three weeks afterwards, and we have two weeks post-altitude in the Chapman study, um, shows pretty good agreement for our uh, persistence or the, uh, the residual findings for uh, altitude training. So go to at least 2,000 meters for four days, and you can expect those benefits to persist for three weeks post-exercise. Maybe more. We haven't looked out past that three-week mark on return to sea level. Which is pretty interesting. At the time that I was first looking into this, we had gone to a conference in uh, Denver, in Colorado. And I'm not a big runner, but I tried to go for a run while I was there and just um, made it like three or four blocks. And I was huffing and puffing. I collapsed and went back to the hotel. But when I got back, we had spent uh, 10 days afterwards traveling around in the mountains. I got back, and I remember I would always ride my bike to, uh, to class, to, to my grad classes, and I felt, oh, this is easy. I was in a lower gear, and I was just motoring up this gradual incline. I thought, oh, maybe it's this residual benefit from killing myself at altitude. Or maybe it's a placebo effect. I don't know. So it seems that there's more... Uh, there's more data, there's more support for the hematological model that the red cell volume, and specifically hemoglobin, is central to or generally contributes to improvements in VO2 max and performance when moving to altitude. When moving to altitude or training at altitude and then performing at sea level. And we see that either by reinfusion, however we expand red cell volume and hemoglobin, uh, EPO administration, inducing it naturally by moving to altitude or synthetically, uh, or hypoxia if you're a lucky responder, and that's why the, the asterisk is here, because it seemed that some individuals responded really well to hypoxic stimulus and had low hemoglobin to begin with, um, so a nice ramping up in response to that um, hypoxia. Others that were naturally well endowed to begin with didn't have as much of an increase. They were uh, non-responders, but performed pretty well to begin with. As far as training paradigms, live low, train high, and intermittent hypoxic treatments or an intermittent hypoxic exposure don't seem to work. The idea that increasing the stress holds some water it makes sense, I understand the rationale, but you compromise the stress of exercise too much because you can't exercise at the same intensity um, having not adapted to altitude or in the face of this hypoxic stress as well. Live high, train high, there seem to be some, some benefits. There's also some controversy over whether or not it's the training camp mentality. Um, it does seem to confer some benefits but there are robust, well-agreed-upon benefits of live high, train low. We observe that in typically any population that we've seen that has used that paradigm. And there are larger benefits than live high, train high. So our preference for maximizing the adaptive response to altitude is live high, train low. And then the method of application of live high, train low would be just what we explored uh, at the end of class and then and starting uh, this class. Three to four weeks of moderate altitude we've observed will increase red cell volume, hemoglobin, VO2 max, and performance. And these effects persist for three weeks, maybe four weeks. <coughs> we don't really have justification to say they persist for four weeks. We didn't measure it that far out, but it's nice matching up three to four weeks of exposure and three to four weeks of added benefit. It's easier to remember that way. Not a whole lot of information or um, substantiation of the non-hematological model that improved buffering and improved efficiency, 
they seem to be cherry picking data points to help explain some controversial situations on that side of the coin. So any questions about this before we move on? And do the complete opposite? Let's do the complete opposite. The complete opposite being if altitude training and moving to altitude was associated with a stress related to low pressure, diving is a stress associated with high pressure, hyperbaria, <coughs> higher than normal pressure, which you don't often encounter except in a situation where you move down in alt altitude or you change your surrounding environment, the medium of the surrounding environment, here obviously water. It's rare to see this situation on a normal day-to-day -day basis. For us land lovers that live on land, which is the majority of the population, sea level is as low as we can go. That's the lowest altitude that we, can, uh, that we typically experience and the highest pressure we typically experience. But hyperbaria and diving has um, some roots in fishing, certainly in tropical countries, pearl diving, searching for sponges, corals, etc. And now there's a whole branch of competitive sport associated with, uh, with diving as well. There's competitive spear fishing and even just competitive apnea. Holding your breath for long periods of time is a sport. And then understanding the mechanisms that contribute to the drive to breathe. Um, how could we push the limits and overcome those mechanisms? There's a whole field of study in understanding the triggers for ventilation, PO2 and PCO2, uh, pH of the blood, and how to, uh, to circumvent or, or deal with those to improve breath holding time and, uh, and time at depth. Now it's worth mentioning, like with altitude or hypoxia, the added stress of temperature um, on top of pressure. Here we also have the added stress of uh, a low temperature typically as we progress further deep into the water. But high pressure is what we're looking at um, to understand the physiology of diving primarily. High pressure from the, the sheer volume of water pressing in around you. How does that impact your ability to su uh, survive at depth? And not automatically breathe at depth unless you have um, a self-contained breathing apparatus. So it's the exception, not the rule, but it's a unique situation that I think is worth exploring. So we're covering in this section, what are the physics of diving and the physics of breathing underwater? How do those physics um, impact our ability to move air in and out of the lungs? Pressure is central to this idea, modifying the ability to move air in and out of the lungs. We'll look at situations where um, Diving goes wrong. There are complications associated with rapid changes, rapid and large changes in pressure. Barotrauma simply means trauma due to uh, barometric pressure or changes in barometric pressure. And then we'll briefly reference some of the, um, the more common um, manifestations of the sickness, decompression sickness, inert gas narcosis, things that are uh, observed with really long and low dives. Those long and low dives are what we would call saturation diving. They're typically professional type dives, not something you would do on a vacation to Hawaii where you go uh, dive for fun. Lastly, I want to talk about how exercise can be used as a protective mechanism. It seems that there is some protection conferred by exercise if you engage a couple days out, a few hours out, uh, on these complications that we'll have discussed. So exercise can be protective, and we'll look at some of the mechanisms of why that might happen. It doesn't seem immediately obvious that exercise would protect you against changes in pressure associated with gases and air in the body. So let's provide some context. We don't often explore 
this situation underwater. Compared to um, living at altitude, the underwater environment is relatively unexplored. I think we've even explored more of space than we have of the oceans on our own planet. And while we have settlements that range from sea level up to 4,000 meters of altitude on land, there aren't any settlements underwater. We can't breathe underwater. We can't survive for long periods underwater. Why would we ever try to make a settlement underwater? But that hasn't stopped us from exploring, at least scratching the surface, pardon the pun, um, but prolonged survival underwater and direct access to air is really limited. Direct access to air, that is being able to breathe directly from the environment is only allowable within about a meter of the surface. Something like shown here in this old-timey bell capsule is not direct access to the surface. They're transporting barrels of, of oxygen or air down that fill up this uh, compartment and then this guy is going out on like a, an ocean walk breathing from the compartment but direct access to air if he were to breathe directly all the way up to the surface passively uh, we can only survive within about a meter of the surface and I say passively um, what I mean by passively is through a snorkel essentially relying on the ventilatory muscles to move air in and out we only have the ability to do that within a meter of the surface because the pressure, two reasons really, the pressure of water around you will affect your ability to move air in and out, and two, the larger the snorkel, the more distance air has to travel, and at some point, it won't be able to travel into your body. Your lungs can only move air a certain distance, if that distance is larger, it is, is larger than the snorkel, air will come in. If it's smaller than the snorkel, the, the new fresh air is trapped somewhere in the snorkel and your body can't access it. So no gas exchange can occur. We're effectively increasing what's called dead space. There's already some dead space. The trachea, the bronchi aren't involved in gas exchange, but they're only about 200 to 300 mils. We can move five or six liters if we need to. So really easy to overcome that physiological dead space. If we add to it with a snorkel, we can only do so up to a point before we're not getting any new fresh air. So modifying the tube in length only serves to increase uh, dead space. In order to move deeper, we can't do it passively. So an old-timey scuba suit with a, uh, with a hose going up to the surface would have an assisted delivery of air. There is fresh air being pumped down, so it's always delivered to the suit, and you're not relying only on the lungs of the individual to move air over that great distance. So to move deeper, we need assisted breathing or assisted delivery of air. And then we have a whole host of other complications it costs a lot to, uh, to move underwater. The more equipment you have to support those deep dives, the harder it is to breathe, the harder it is to move around, the greater the cost of uh, moving around is. And so you need to, uh, to deliver more oxygen. Equipment gets bigger. A whole balancing act. So we get around that by either pumping air down or sending compressed air with the individual, sending an air supply with the individual. The ability to successfully extract oxygen from that air supply depends on the surrounding environment. It's radically different than living at sea level. And we'll ignore the fact that when you're underwater, you're swimming and not walking. When you're underwater, you might not be able to see too well. There are hazards underwater. It's turbulent. You're always trying to fight staying at depth versus rising to the surface. All of those things we're not really going to acknowledge. But what we're focusing on specifically is the pressure difference. As soon as you go underwater, the pressure of the surrounding medium is noticeable. It's larger. 
and it's the it's analogous to the pressure we explored when we moved to altitude. The column of that medium pressing down against your head as you move to altitude, the column is smaller, pressure is lower. Here we have a much larger column, but not only of air, of water, which is a lot more dense than air. Hence, gravity exerts more force on it than air, and pressure is larger than air. Let's explore how different it is. A normal situation is shown here. Pressure at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury, or we're going to define that as one atmospheric equivalent, one atmosphere. 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere. This changes if you move to altitude, it will go down. You'll be at a fraction of a normal atmosphere. And conversely, it'll change if you go below sea level. You'll be at multiple atmospheres. Let's say you ascended to 4,000 meters, which is the highest known settlement on Earth, with people living there full time. Pressure at that settlement, atmospheric pressure, is about 460 millimeters of mercury. 300 millimeters of mercury less than at sea level. And so we can use this to figure out a, uh, a rate of change. As you ascend, pressure drops by a fraction of a millimeter of mercury per meter. It's imperceptible on the short term. As you're climbing a hill, it's imperceptible. If you go out to the racetrack and you climb, um, is it Browns Mountain? No, Beaver Mountain. You're not going to notice a change in pressure even though you're ascending 200 meters. 0.07 millimeters of mercury per meter ascended. Compare that to diving underwater. Descend an arbitrary 10 meters and pressure doubles. So from 760 millimeters of mercury to 1520 millimeters of mercury, or two atmospheres. Therefore, every 10 meters we add, or sorry, every meter we add 76 millimeters of mercury of pressure. This is a hundred times, no, a thousand times, a thousand fold different being underwater and adding pressure when you descend versus being above land and ascending to altitude. Many fold different. So the, the pressure due to water ramps up much more quickly and the magnitude is a lot greater. That change in pressure is what causes complications. Now what are those complications? General rule of thumb, while we're on this slide, every 10 meters, pressure doubles. So every 10 meters, that's not true. Every 10 meters, you add one atmosphere. In this situation, we're going from zero to 10 meters below surface, so it doubles. But if you go to 20 meters below surface, you add another atmosphere. 30 meters, you add a third atmosphere. And we'll see that laid out on a schematic coming up, but I just wanted to present that to you uh, here. Also consider, if you're breathing from an air supply that you carry with you, the air that you're breathing is at surrounding pressure. It's at the pressure of the surrounding environment. You're not taking a bubble of sea level air down with you. It's not at a lower pressure. It's also subject, just like your body is, to the surrounding environment. So the air that you're breathing is at whatever pressure you happen to be at from descending. That pressure of descent causes problems physically in the body, especially if that descent occurs quickly or that change in pressure occurs quickly. And it's not in the fluid-filled compartments of the body. We generally think of these as uncompressible. They are compressible. Fluid can expand and contract somewhat, but very little. The fluid compartments are generally unaffected by pressure changes. It's the open compartments, the air-filled compartments, 
that are subject to large changes in, in pressure. Things like the lungs, which are pretty important for survival, especially at depth or, or anywhere. The gastrointestinal tract has a lot of air in it. Bone contains a lot of air in open spaces. Sinuses, inner ear, these spaces are not fluid-filled. They are air-filled, and those, um, those spaces can be compressed, can expand and contract with, with changes in pressure. Importantly, there are finite limits in which they can expand and contract especially the sinuses that are limited by bone, the lungs that are limited by the thoracic cage. There are, there are limits to the expansion and contraction of these air-filled spaces. So, it's not that diving will cause trouble. It's that the change in pressure due to diving, the differential in pressure will cause trouble. If you move down slowly and pressure changes, you can equilibrate and, and uh, get used to that pressure slowly, then these, these spaces will generally also adapt relatively easily. It's very quick changes in pressure that affect the size or the volume contained within these spaces that causes an issue. What we're describing is equilibration. We want the spaces, the pressure in the spaces, to equilibrate with the pressure around us. So let's observe um, a stepwise schematic of how pressure changes with depth. And this is the same idea that we just acknowledged. With every 10 meters of descent, you add one atmosphere. And what that phenomenon is an example of is Boyle's Law, which says in a closed system, if we uh, keep temperature constant, volume will change uh, in an inverse manner to pressure. So higher pressure will compress a volume. And we observe that readily with air. We have one volume of air that stays fixed. At sea level, we can breathe in six liters into our lung maximally. That volume is at one atmospheric pressure, and that volume, if it remains unchanged and temperature stays constant, if we go down to 10 meters, its volume is cut in half. If we go down to 20 meters, its volume is cut in a third. That volume is inversely proportional to the amount of pressure placed upon it. It's the same amount of air it just occupies a smaller space. The same amount of air just occupies a smaller space. What was six liters at sea level becomes one and a half liters at four atmospheres, three meters below the surface. And you can visualize this phenomenon really nicely by looking at a change in pressure here <coughs> identified by a change in the, uh, the weight compressing a gas. We have some pressure at sea level. It's small. But as we descend 10 meters, we're now at two atmospheres. The pressure on that gas has compressed it. It's cut it in half. Notice there's the same number of air molecules, right? It's the same stuff the space that contains it has simply contracted. The pressure has forced it into a smaller space. It's not less air, it's just a smaller volume. It's not less air, it's just a smaller volume. The problem arises, air is compressed but the lungs all of a sudden don't start only taking in 500 mils when you move into the ocean. They don't take in 200 mils per breath as you dive deep. The volume that you want to bring into the lungs doesn't decrease. Your lungs still function according to their physiological blueprints. They still function to move in a normal tidal volume and their capacity is still six liters. 
the air just takes up a smaller space. So air that you breathe underwater, here from a, a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or scuba. The air that you breathe underwater is compressed. It's compressed in relation to how deep you've Doven, divin, how you dove, how far underwater you've gone, I'll put it that way. The air is compressed, but the lungs still function similarly to when you were on land. Ventilation is unaffected. You still want to move in a normal tidal volume, and your lung capacity should still have the same physical limits. If you've gone to two atmospheres, your normal ventilation, then, will use twice the air. Air takes up half of the space, so to fill the same amount of lung, you bring in twice the air. You can see where this would be a problem. If you have twice the air in your lungs, being at depth, and you all of a sudden ascend, you all of a sudden end up back at sea level. Twice the air in your lungs might be a problem. <clears throat> Is that concept clear? Pressure reduces the volume that the air occupies. The lungs still move the same amount of air. That air, or that volume, simply contains more air than it normally would. Now, the physical expansion of air isn't often the problem. It's not possible to ascend so quickly that your air's double in, or your, lung, your lungs double inflate. You will take breaths as you ascend. You will expel a larger volume of air at a deeper um, depth and then take in a smaller volume of air as you ascend and then by breathing in and out as you ascend, your lungs will equilibrate. Where the, the, the pressure difference really um, causes issues is in the bubbling out of individual gases from fluid, from tissues in the body. The volume of air will expand, but it's not like your chest will inflate like a balloon as you ascend. The problem is in the dissolved gases in the fluids of the body. And the dissolved gases adhere to Henry's law. Henry's and Boyle's law often go hand in hand. Boyle simply says pressure and uh, volume are inversely related. Henry's law says that the amount of an individual gas that will dissolve is based on the pressure. If there's more of a push to push oxygen into blood, to push carbon dioxide into blood. If there's more push, then more of that gas will dissolve. I think that makes sense. At a given pressure, the amount of gas dissolved in a fluid is proportional to that pressure. I think, I think that's written wrong. If you're having problems with that statement, you're not alone. This should be at a given temperature. Gas dissolved in a fluid is proportional to the pressure. So make sure that you make that change. At a given pressure, if pressure is the same, then changing the pressure will change the gas dissolved? That doesn't make sense. At a given temperature, when the conditions are fixed, if you increase pressure, you'll push more gas into a fluid. And this is the phenomenon that allows us to carbonate water, that allows us to carbonate beer. CO2 dissolved in a fluid gives fluid gas, gives it bubbles. That's CO2 dissolved in a fluid. That happens in your body as well, just not to the same degree. It happens readily with CO2. It's physical characteristic is that it has what we call a high solubility coefficient. It will dissolve easily in fluids if pressure goes up. 
That's fine. CO2 dissolves in our blood all the time. And it comes out of our blood all the time. We have no problem with that. Oxygen, on the other hand, has a really low solubility. No matter how hard we try, we can't dissolve oxygen in appreciable amounts into the blood. That's why we need hemoglobin. It doesn't just dissolve in plasma. Even when diving at really high pressures, oxygen won't go in. It resists it. So the gas has a physical characteristic that we can't modify that will respond to changes in pressure. CO2 and O2 do what they're supposed to do. They don't really change. They don't cause us problems. What causes us problems is nitrogen. Nitrogen, unfortunately, has a medium solubility coefficient, which means normally it doesn't want to dissolve in fluid. But if you push it, you can make it dissolve in fluid. Nitrogen will dissolve into the fluids of the body as you dive. And then as you surface, it will bubble out of the fluids in the body. And it's this, this variability or this flexibility in being able to dissolve in fluid that makes nitrogen problematic. Also consider 80% of the air we breathe right now is nitrogen. For us, we never really think about it. It's inert. It goes in and it comes out. It doesn't do anything in the body. It goes in and it comes out. As you move um, into the water, it goes in and it comes out, but it goes further in the deeper you dive. It's this movement of nitrogen into fluid that is fundamental to decompression sickness. The bends, decompression sickness is due to nitrogen bubbling out of the fluids in the body. If you dive deep enough, if you dive long enough, you saturate the fluids in the body with dissolved nitrogen. <coughs> that in and of itself isn't a problem, but it's the, it's the tendency for nitrogen to come out of those fluids as you move back to the surface that causes a problem. This is only due to the fact that pressure goes up. And you can see it similarly illustrated on this slide, just like before, where pressure goes up and the volume is compressed. What we're adding to this example is fluid. It's not simply a volume of air that's compressed, but we're looking at how those individual molecules of a gas will naturally fit into this fluid. As that volume compresses, same number of molecules, more of them are in the fluid at this point. If this were oxygen, this would actually resist taking on oxygen molecules. They would sit mostly in this space up here. If it's CO2, they'll move in really easily. We can push nitrogen in if we need to. So as pressure goes up, Volume is compressed, and the number of, of gas molecules that fit into this fluid are increased. That's what causes problems um, when we move back to the surface after a long dive. 